What's up guys, today we are back, another video discussing Mr. Burcham as well as King of the Hill and some of the comedy and the issues that I have with the entire series of Mr. Burcham more broadly. But first, ah, they're trying to cancel me, the woke mind virus is trying to cancel me, the deep state is coming after me. <laughs> and of course by that I mean the copyright holders of Mr. Burcham make it very very difficult to get these videos uploaded at all. They object to me using brief clips of their show to, I don't know, talk about their show, to provide criticism and commentary on their show. Shocking. The free speech people don't know what fair use is on the internet. And this is the most frustrating part of it all. They're winning. <laughs> I mean, I have to pay $15 a month to see one of the worst shows ever written. And I have to live with the fact that now, because of my videos and other similar videos, a bunch of 50-year-olds have discovered Mr. Bertram, who otherwise never would have seen it, and are now paying for Daily Wire Plus, the favorite streaming service of the QAnon shaman. Nevertheless, she persisted. I, I mean, he persisted. Or me persisted, if you're a caveman. I actually think it's really important that I do these videos talking about the episodes, talking about their structural problems, because nobody is analyzing this seriously, and I think it's important that somebody look at Mr. Bertram from a critical lens of someone who's actually studied film and television, you know, because my life goal was to watch and review Mr. Bertram and to be broke forever, and I am killing both of those goals right now. By the way, if you're watching this and you like my content and you've watched it before, please subscribe. It's free and only about 2% of you are subscribed. More subscribers helps me grow the channel and get more videos out for you as soon as possible. So thank you and please subscribe. And you know, it's also important to make this video so we can have a laugh at <laughs> their expense. I mean, the jokes are pretty terrible and they just keep somehow getting worse. Nobody finds this show funny unless their target demographic is people who have had a railroad spike driven into their brain Phineas Gage style. And what I find most interesting about the story of Phineas Gage is that he survived that and afterwards he was just kind of a little bit of an asshole. <laughs> that was the only change people noticed. And I am gagging for you, faggot. Come on back. But this is the thing that really gets me is it's not even that hard to make jokes that are conservative coded and are making fun of liberals and find a mainstream audience. There's several shows that do this either completely or partially. Shows like Last Man Standing, Family Ties, F is for Family, noticing a trend with the family here, South Park, and King of the Hill. And do I love all these shows and all the jokes they make? No, because truthfully there's only so many jokes about how liberals are crazy for wanting to solve climate change that I can take in, one, in the course of one human lifetime. When the world is rid of Man Bear Pig, everyone will say, Thank you, Al Gore! But this is the key here. Even if I'm disagreeing with the premise of their humor, it's coming from the premise of humor. They're trying to actually make people laugh, and I'm unsure if that's what Mr. Bertram is really trying to do. Although, to give credit to those fine folks at the Daily Wire, they do open with one of the funnier jokes I've seen throughout these episodes. The joke is that Mr. Bertram and Carponzi are gay for each other and they dance. Uh, that's it. And, uh, yeah, the bar is in hell, but that's where we are. Every time I watch this show, I'm just looking for something that I can cling onto that signals that maybe the next 25 minutes of my life won't be completely horrible. And having a dream sequence where the main character is dancing with the antagonist and the joke can be basically boiled down to, haha, they're gay. I mean, I guess that's what passes for a funny joke these days and in 2006 and in uh, a lot of my stand-up routines. Is it getting hot in here? Is anyone else sweating a little bit? And I do feel obligated to point out for all my bis Mr. Birch lore heads out there that this doesn't even really make any sense. Because we know, canonically, <laughs> crazy thing to say, that Mr. Carponzi is heterosexual, for which he apologized in the pilot. Would you like to resume your search for Nancy Pelosi bikini pics? Heck yes! We also know he's attracted to Nancy Pelosi, which makes two of us. Hubba hubba Nancy P. OMG. Now that felt horrible. She is one of the most corrupt members in all of Congress, so I apologize for that joke. So we've reached episode four of I actually don't know how many episodes. There's no information on it online that I could find the last time I looked. So I don't know how long I'm in this in this fight for. Um, it could be five, it could be six, it could be ten, it could be twelve, it could be twenty. Oh my, it could be twenty-two. It could be twenty-two. Oh dear lord. Oh no 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 no. I'm trapped in a seemingly unending labyrinth of shit, or if we want like a more contemporary reference, a corn maze where a bunch of kids have defecated because they got lost and couldn't find a bathroom. Either way, I have no way out, and it smells, it reeks, of fecal matter. Episode 4 is called 127 Hours or So, obviously a reference to 127 Hours, the book and the movie, and I realize I haven't talked about the titles of the other episodes. The Day Drinking Veterans Day episode was Thank You For Your Meal Service, and the episode where they replace a table saw was called Thank This Means Warranty. And when you put it like that, you really just realize how uncreative and horrible these plot lines are. We had an entire episode where they're replacing a table saw. I can't wait for episode 5 
five when Mr. Bertram assigns his students to watch paint dry, and then Carponzi comes by and calls him ableist. Because that's what comedy is, guys, right? It's when the liberal says something crazy! Because that's how liberals talk in real life. Okay, it's too early in the video for me to be going completely off the rails. I'm gonna rein it in. But I'm reining it in. I'm reining it in! <laughs> Maestro, anyone see that one? No? Okay, just me? Okay, it wasn't good, so let's move on. And speaking of menial tasks, Eddie and Wendy, and I hate that I know these characters by name, they're gonna do some home improvement while Bertram is away camping for spring break. They wanna replace the floorboards. And I love how this is an animated cartoon, one of the mediums where you can literally do almost anything, your creativity is basically the limit. We're, we're having our characters routinely do in multiple episodes some of the most mundane and truly boring things possible. We're replacing the floorboards, that's an exciting way to draw the audience in. And of course, they naturally fuck it up because they're useless and horrible because that's what the script says that they are. And to fix it, they have to bring in Jeannie, who's very immersed in her character after being in a kid's version of Pulp Fiction. This concludes with a nearly two minute long sequence, which is a nearly line for line copy of a scene from Pulp Fiction. Please, oh, please would, be nice. would be nice. Get it straight, straight. Buster. I'm, I'm not, not here to here think, to please. please. I'm here to tell you what to do. The self-preservation is an instinct you possess. You better possess. fucking do you it and do it, do it quick. And do it quick. And I will give credit to Mr. Bertram because it temporarily reminded me of a piece of media that is not one of the worst adult cartoons ever, but instead is one of the greatest movies of the 1990s. I was able to temporarily escape from my punishment. I think what frustrates me the most about this sequence is not only is it terribly boring and dull, but it also is basically a microcosm, or since it's a two minute scene, a macrocosm, of all this show's problems when it tries to do pop culture references. It's trying to reference pop culture without playing off of the strengths of any of its characters, while also not even really trying to make jokes. Like, this scene doesn't have any jokes. The show is hoping maybe that by seeing this pop culture reference, we'll think, oh, I've seen that movie! And we'll just jump up and down in our seats and start salivating like the monkey pushing the pleasure buttons or the old people pushing the slot machines. But if you're gonna reference Pulp Fiction, why not, I don't I know this may sound crazy, why not make jokes about it? You know Pulp Fiction, the movie where famously the director wrote himself into the movie so he could say the N-word multiple times? You're telling me there's no room to make fun of that in this supposedly anti-woke cartoon? No shots to be taken against the Hollywood cabal of elite liberals? I'm just trying to put myself as an empath into their minds, in, into how they would write a joke. But they didn't even try. But if we're still going with the gay equals funny line of thinking, great, why not reference the pimp? I'm sure the people who thought that Harrison Butker's speech telling women to get back in the kitchen was awesome, I'm sure they'd get a laugh at seeing a gimp. You know, <laughs> that's a gimp, that's what gay people do. Now I know I just used a southern accent to portray sexism, and in the spirit of fairness and both sidesism, I will now repeat that process in a Boston accent of a man telling his woman to get him dunks, which is the New England equivalent. Hey sugar tits, give me some- <laughs> Hey sugar tits, give me a beer. Give me a beer while you're out there. Give me, give me an iced coffee from Dunks. Give me, give me a large iced coffee. And before we get to Bertram's plot in the episode, I want to talk about something that's come up a lot in relation to the show. And that's another show, a much better show, King of the Hill. On the surface, they're both actually pretty similar. They're both about a conservative white man and about his family and about their lives in suburban America. But Bertram and his family are actually blended, a product of a remarriage. Wendy and Bertram got remarried and Wendy continues to weirdly refer to Bertram only by his last name instead of his first name, which is Richard or Dick like a complete psychopath, King of the Hill didn't have a blended family. So is Mr. Bertram actually more woke than King of the Hill? No, of, of course not. While some people have cited King of the Hill as an example of conservative comedy, I don't really know if that's entirely accurate. Sure, King of the Hill bears some of the aesthetics of conservative comedy and does make jokes at the expense of students, hippies, and people who just don't want to work anymore, talking points so salient it has made a shocking resurgence in the post-COVID years. And these jokes generally are isolated to be more one-off instances. They're not the bread and butter in the heart of the show, and when they're focused on is sort of when the show is at its weakest. But if you don't believe me, listen to the creator of the show, Mike Judge. I try not to let the show get too political. To me, it's more social than political, I guess you'd say, because that's funnier. 
I don't really like political reference humor that much. We're selling a dream of perfection, like fashion models who never gain weight, or Android phones that never crash. Or the Green New Deal. Yes, shockingly, the TV show that was beloved by millions of people didn't feel the need to make jokes in the structure of Aren't Liberals Crazy? Followed by a guitar riff. Now, Jeannie, it's important not to lie. Just be honest, like our great Secretary of State, Colin Powell. Now that joke may be a little bit too cerebral for Mr. Bertram because it would imply that the writers had any degree of contrition for the Iraq War at all. Sorry, I don't mean to be going all lefty on you just because I'm wearing my thrifted from Goodwill USS All-Star shirt. But King of the Hill is an example of how to do comedy right because they were focused not on triggering the snowflakes and owning the libs, they were focused on writing great characters and interesting plot lines for those characters to change and test their desires. You know, the basics of narrative storytelling. Hank throughout the series grows as a person and gradually, if begrudgingly, starts to learn more and accept more of the changing world around him. And I don't expect we're going to see that from our titular hero, Mr. Bertram. And speaking of Bertram, what's he up to in episode 4? Well, not a lot. Episode 4 is mostly a series of flashbacks to Bertram's past because he is stuck in a lathe. Hence the title being a reference to 127 Hours, the true story where a climber, Aaron Ralston, gets stuck in a canyon and has to cut off some of his arm to survive. Which, by the way, not to put too fine a point on it, but I've read the book that this was referencing, and there was a lot of comedic missed opportunity. And there's like an entire chapter of him drinking his own piss. And what's the deal? Mr. Bertram is too highbrow to make a, a piss drinking? joke? Really? We already have bottom of the barrel humor anyway, why not go even lower? Can't possibly have been worse than that Green New Deal joke. All this happens because Bertram has to update his grades because Carponzi tells him that all his grades need to be the exact same because of woke or, or something. So we're rewarding the stupid lazy kids and punishing the smart hard workers. Yes! That's the only fair thing to do! And if you needed any more evidence that the writers of the show live in a fantasy world and not in the real America, well, look no further. Guys, I promise, public schools are not a secret appendage of a dystopian Marxist deep state that wants to punish the hard workers and reward the lazy. Mr. Bertram then goes back in the school to not change the grades, so I don't know why he went back in anyway if he was just not going to change them, but whatever. And then he gets his jacket stuck in the lathe for several days. Oh yeah, and this is where Patrick Warburton comes in, probably the second or the most famous person they got associated with this project. He played Joe in Family Guy, and he's here to voice the mascot of a frozen meal brand. For real American appetites. Burly man is two out of three astronauts' choice for. Out of this world meals! But yeah, I'll address the elephant in the room. He could have just taken the jacket off. Yeah. Yeah. And I know the whole point is the jacket is supposed to be like so tough and maybe that's why he can't get his hand out. But ultimately when he gets rescued, he's rescued by a pretty basic pocket knife. And when you see it cut open, I mean, there were other alternatives that he could have tried before being trapped here for five days. And as I've mentioned, we learn a lot about Bertram through flashbacks in this episode in case you were asking for it. I mean, I personally wasn't. And I don't really know what to make of the fact that Bertram was dating a lesbian other than the fact that uh, that reads... That reads, I'm a lesbian now. Well, that explains the Subaru. Get it? Because lesbians drive Subarus. Ha ha. You're a, I'm a lesbian now. Bertram's mom was also an alcoholic, presumably. I mean, I don't really know what else to call a person who drinks an entire martini in one gulp. And let's be honest, if you're making martinis at home anyway, you're already kind of on the watch list for alcoholism. Oh, it's classy to have the equivalent of two shots worth of vodka as long as you add a little bit of olive brine and a fancy French fortified wine. Uh, newsflash, it's not. Not unless you do it with gin. Oop. We also see him meet Wendy for the first time where she calls him a white Obama, which is one of those jokes that really functions as like, oh my gosh, if this was written by a liberal parodying conservatives, it would actually be funny, but it's written by conservatives. I don't know. Maybe they're just trying to make fun of this liberal character. Or maybe they're, uh, I don't, I'm not even, I can't, I can't go any more into the minds of these writers. I'm already starting to lose my own. It's then followed by him naming a bunch of tools to Wendy in a way that's supposed to be seductive and flirty, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. We know Wendy knows almost nothing about tools. Okay, sure. She's just doing it because she finds that attractive, but 
Ugh. Maybe we're supposed to find it funny that she is very attracted to this very flubby guy, but the fact that they literally went through the trouble to animate Blush means I really feel like we're supposed to read this scene kind of straight. After all, Bertram is the self-insert for the audience, so I'm not even sure how much comedy we're supposed to be even getting from this. Bertram spills some denatured alcohol and starts hallucinating, and he hallucinates that his tools are becoming people and they're all singing to him and mocking him, which it's bad but at least they're trying. When I was watching this sequence, I felt like a parent watching their kids play Little League, but like when they're four, so they barely understand how the game works, but I'm like out there like, you go, you go, Richard. Yes, make make an attempt at something creative, at doing something creative, yes. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pat, you are a broken, broken man after having watched 100 episodes of Mr. Bertram, and you're correct, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's neat. You know, it reminded me a little bit like a much worse version of Brave Little Toaster or Veggie details you know animation is such a creative medium and this is the first time they've honestly tried to take advantage of it in any way which you know that's worth something it's not worth a lot but it's worth something although of course this is the same episode where they literally directly ripped off a scene from pulp fiction line for line for two minutes so one step forward, two steps back. Eventually, Mr. Bertram gets rescued by Davey. Davey was going to fail the class because he didn't submit a final project, which I'm gonna just say, it doesn't make any sense. I'm like a broken record. Because in the pilot, we know that Davey was actually starting to take an interest in woodworking and in the class of Mr. Bertram. But he also taught me how to use a totally sick orbital sander, and I'm actually starting to like it. And he had to use multiple of the skills he learned in the class to even break into the school and then happen to be be able to rescue Mr. Bertram, but somehow he doesn't have anything to submit for his final pro- okay. Yeah, Mr. Bertram failed that student as a teacher, so we know that Mr. Bertram's not a good teacher, and the show is kind of divided as to whether or not that's the message it wants to put forward, because if you watch the pilot, it's very clear we're supposed to think he is a good teacher, but basically every single action we've seen in that pilot and ever since basically says the exact opposite. I would say that this episode showed signs of life the same way a corpse shows signs of life via rigor mortis. While there were some bright spots, most of the show was just boring and most of the comedy still boils down to political ranting. And lifting almost verbatim line for line a two minute scene from one of the most famous movies of all time is just pure unadulterated laziness. This show is only going to get better if Bertram is forced to confront the outside world and actually do some introspection on his worldview, but of course that's never going to happen because his worldview is the worldview of the creator and of the audience and of the Daily Wire Plus, so I'm not holding my breath, but I'll see you for the next one. <laughs> oh gosh. But that's going to do it for me, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like. Please comment. It really helps out the channel. Helps get this video out to more people. And I want to know your thoughts. I read every comment. So if you have something positive to say about the episode, something negative to say, I do read them all. So please comment. Please like. And if you like my content, new videos every week, one to two, please subscribe. I laid that out in a really weird way. <laughs> but as always, my name is Patrick, and my friends call me Pat, and I'll see you for the next one.